this is I know that this was covered for those students who are already interpreting. I don't know that this was covered for you in your technique class or in any of your ASL classes. I doubt it. Not the way that we're going to talk about it. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about seven specific features of ASL that we have to be cognizant of when we're interpreting because we have to do something specific with that. We have to either um, expand into ASL or we have to compress some of these features into English. The reason why we do that is to make it sound idiomatic or look idiomatic in the appropriate. Okay? So there'll be plenty of examples. So if you know these seven features from your ASL classes, great. And I want you to think about using them um, with specific strategies to help you improve your interpretation. Okay? So I'll go through them all individually. But here are the seven features listed. The first is contrasting, um, which is kind of a compare contrast. But instead of just giving a definitive statement, you're going to give the statement and then add an opposite to make it crystal clear. And we do that purposely when we interpret. The second one is called faceting. Yes, Katie. This is interpreting from English to ASL. It would be just a book. Right. Right. From English to ASL, we expand. From ASL to English, we compress. And when we go into each of them, I'll give you examples of both. Okay, so it'll be a little bit easier, and then with the examples, it should be really clear. Okay? Um, so, faceting is a, a term used to add information. Um, if we're going into English, we're adding adjectives to describe something. If it's into ASL, we're adding signs, descriptive signs. The third is reiteration, which is a repetition. You are repeating something. Usually in ASL, again, we do that for emphasis. When we go from ASL into English, we have to do something different with reiteration. Utilizing 3D space, we know about that. Explain by example. Does anybody know what we call this in ASL? We talk about English categories for things like vehicle, jewelry. They don't have those category labels in ASL, so we give lists. So it's called listing. We also call it listing, which is explained by example. So we're going to define something by using several examples of that category. The next one is couching, which is Really, cultural mediation. A little bit of explanation, um, a little bit of expansion in the explanation category. And then the last one is describe and do. Anybody think of what this might be if you are telling a story in ASL and you're using a strategy called describe and then do? So it would be like. Um if you're describing someone walking down the street, then you say, like, a man walks down the street, and then you show it. Then you show it, exactly. Then you do it. Yep. We call it characterization in ASL. You're assuming the character, and you're actually doing whatever it was that the character was doing, or whatever you're describing. All right, so let's break them apart now. Let's start with contrasting. In ASL, you'll see people do this all the time. Again, it's for clarity and emphasis. Here's an example I'll give you right now. Um, it is a man walking normally, not slow. Okay. So it would be. Okay. That room is cold. See how I contrasted it? We don't do that in English. In English, we use a declarative statement, this room is cold. 
we don't do a lot of that. It's not born, it's not taught, because it's implied as English speakers we speak in declarative. It's either a positive statement or a negative statement, we don't add anything on. So, those are two distinct differences in the language between English and ASL. So, if I'm interpreting from English into ASL, I want to use contrasting techniques. So the speaker would say, um, it's a beautiful day outside. And I might sign, okay. it seems like I'm wasting time because I'm adding all of this stuff that I don't need because we're English speakers. But deaf people in ASL is very descriptive language. You make everything explicit. Okay, does that make sense? Now, if I'm voicing, like we're going to do this afternoon, and you see someone sign this, how would you put that into a right, proper English sentence? The room cold, period. Now, your tendency when you start Voicing from ASL into English, pretty very smiling. What's your tendency going to be? To say every single thing that you see. Because if you see a sign, you're going to want to say it. But it doesn't sound natural in English. The point is to mediate between the two languages. The two languages are different. That's why we're there to interpret them appropriately. Otherwise, your hearing consumers are going to be looking at the deaf person like they're speaking like a kindergartner. But that's just the difference in the language. So in ASL, when we're interpreting this way, we have to expand and add contrasting. When we're voicing, we have to compress it, get rid of it, and make it crystal clear. Great. Um, I guess, like, doesn't that kind of go against the whole that people like to be like exactly to the point, whereas it depends on what you mean by clear and to the point. We're using our English filters again, and for us, clear and to the point is this room is cold. For us English speakers, all of that other implicit information comes to our minds. We're thinking, yeah, it's not warm in here, it's not hot, it's usually hot in here, it's not hot, it's cold. All that stuff is going on in here. Clear and to the point in ASL is to be the deaf horse. It's cold in here. It's not warm. It's not hot. Remember last week it was sticking in here, but it's not sticking in here right now. It's cold. That's crystal clear in ASL. See the difference? So our definition as English speakers in hearing culture, where we never make eye contact, we don't share too much information, we're kind of standoffish. You just say it nice and crystal clear. So, I hope your message got through. Crystal clear in ASL is share your life, share your information, tell me everything about your life, what happened, blah, 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 blah. So that, until the point is completely crystal clear, that's clear in ASL. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to know. A lot of it is really going to depend on your consumer. How savvy your consumer is, how well educated your consumer is, if they really need you to use ASL or if it's kind of a fine English that they're using, then do you have to do contrasting? No. But if you're looking for ASL with a culturally deaf individual, this is one of the techniques that they're going to give you as part of their language, is what we need to get them at. Okay? Any other questions about it? I don't think you're smiling at that one. I think that's a good question. That's right. What do you know? I would err on the side of caution because the lay person will think ASL is sort of English but kind of brought down to a lower level. You've heard that before. People have described ASL that way before. Um, so if you're stepping over and you're really getting into a lot of explanations or you're contrasting all the time when something is really simple just to say it, it's kind of belittling the consumer that you're working with. And 
if, if they don't need that, you don't need to add it. Some consumers will. So it's a, it'll be a gut feeling. You'll, you'll figure it out. Okay? Any other questions about it? All right. Fastening. Fastening is bundling components together to make up meaning. Um, Basically, you can think of it as adjectives. All right, so if I was to be a deaf signer, and I am going to sign this concept, a beautiful sunset, this is probably how I would sign it, maybe something like this. I'm not sure. You guys make it up. Edge or adjective. Um, Make our ex 
expressive interpretation crystal clear, or we compress the reiteration that we see in ASL to make it clear in English. Reiteration is just a repetition. Again, here's an example. You'll see that people do this all the time. Some people call it bookend. I use the sign funny twice. How would you voice that in English? Or, or, I'm going to tell you a really funny story, but you don't want to say, because you're going to see, story, funny, funny, story, funny, so you don't want to voice it to ASL, I'm going to tell you a funny story, it's funny. <laughs> don't laugh, because you all are going to do it. You guarantee you are going to do it because that's what you see and you're going to be so worried about dropping information or not getting all of it that it's going to come out, it's going to sound kind of choppy and you may be getting all the information and maybe all the right information and the feedback you're going to be getting is make it sound idiomatic, make it sound more natural. Use phrases that we use in English all the time, like a spectacular sunrise instead of it turns the sky orange and yellow and multiple colors. And it we have say things like that. So when I say idiomatic and you're going into spoken English, say things the way we say them naturally. And the meaning is the same. I'm going to tell you a funny story. It's funny is the same as saying, I just said that. Ew. Is the same as if in English I'm going to interpret it as I'm going to tell you a story, a hysterical story. I'm going to tell you a really funny story. The meaning is exactly the same, right? I haven't gotten rid of anything. I haven't changed the meaning. I'm not adding. I'm not omitting. I'm interpreting the meaning perfectly. I'm just using the appropriate language forms from one language to the other. Does that make sense? And I'm going to walk around with it. Pink sticky in the bottom of my shoe. Oh, off the point for just a second. Let me tell you what I did yesterday. In the high tech lab, you know that little round sort of table that the teachers use? I use all the way in the front. Unbeknownst, I sit on tables all the time. Unbeknownst to me, that table flipped. I didn't know that it flipped. The whole top flipped. So we're in class. Somebody's birthday. He gave me a cookie. I grab a cookie. I go to sit on this table, the whole table flips backwards. I went head over tea kettle or whatever you say that. On the ground, I sat there for minutes. I just like stood up, but I sat there for minutes because I was like, seriously? And I was like, Toki, it fell on the floor. I was like, really? So this is not my week. I don't know what's going on here. But nobody had a video camera going, unfortunately, because I would have put it on, I don't know, nervous when they come in or something. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Is this about me? What you keep saying is, is a lot of the confused inflection when you're going from ASL to English. Mm -hmm. and it's reiteration and, and you know, funny story, funny. You say, I, I, oh my God, a really funny story. Beautiful, because that that gets to the heart of the message. Your inflection is called the affective development, and the deaf person who is telling you this is giving you affective development, only they're giving it to you in time. How we make our audience or our person we're talking to, how we make them feel that same way is by using a question. And this makes them tell the story. Now you're ready for it. In ASL, you would see somebody do, they don't do that. They're going to do, and you see that, and you're like, oh, this is going to be a funny story, right? Because you see they use that affect. So the way we do it is we compress all those extra signs that we don't need into either inflection or a change in sentence structure. Exactly. Make sense? Yes? Good? All right. The next one, I thought this was too. The next one is utilizing 3D space and laugh because as new interpreters, you guys are going to do this. You're going to make a new space every time. And it's just it's funny. It happens to everybody. All right. You know that in ASL, you use 3D space. Everything is set up. You 
act things out, cars move, people move. It's like watching a movie in front of us in space, yes? Okay. So when we are interpreting from English into ASL, we need to use as much space as possible to make the point clear. However, when we go from ASL into spoken English, we don't do that. We don't describe things that are happening in space. Let me give you an example. Um, how about if I said, um, something like, last week I went to San Diego, I flew to San Diego, stayed for a week. And on my way home, I had to have a connecting flight, so I stopped in Vegas and then ended up coming back to Chicago. I was going to interpret that and say, I thought it might look something like this. Right? Okay, that's some, something like it would look. So my interpretation into spoken English should not be something like German or I know, because you know what I'm going to do with this. Yeah, because you're going to do it because this is what you see. So you're going to say possibly something like, last week on vacation, I flew from Chicago heading west across the country and landed in San Diego where I stayed for about a week. Then I hopped back in the plane, and now I'm heading east to come home, but I didn't come all the way home to Chicago, so I had to fly into Las Vegas, and the plane landed there, and then actually I had to wait for a while, and then the plane took off again, heading east one more time, until it finally landed in Chicago. But that's what you saw, right? Okay. So how better would you put that into English by compressing all of that spatial stuff, and just give me a nice... English sentence or two to describe what I just said. Beautiful! Yay! See, idiomatic, right? It's called the layover. That's exactly, I never signed layover in ASL when I told you my story, but we're compressing all that spatial stuff. Short, sweet, to the point, everybody who's hearing in the room now knows exactly what happened on my way back, right? Excellent, excellent example. Okay? The only time in English, in spoken English, that we do actually describe specific movements is occasionally if we're talking about maybe a car accident. You know, sometimes we may say, I was driving and I was in the right lane and I was hardly in the left lane and we decided that they wanted to make a right-hand turn, so they pulled off in front of me through the, whatever, oncoming traffic. And we may describe something like that for a car accident. But most of the times, we don't describe the spatial stuff. So just because you see it in ASL doesn't mean that you have to start telling you what direction we're going or okay, just compress it. It sounds idiomatic in English. Any questions about that? Good. All right, the next one is couching. Remember that ASL, again, high contact language. Lots and lots and lots and lots of detail. English, low contact. We say what it is and we're done. Okay? If I'm interpreting into ASL and a hearing person is talking about, I don't know, a phone call that they had the other day and they got mad because while they were waiting online, their call waiting kept beeping in, and somebody else was trying to get a hold of them. Well, most deaf people don't use the phone, both. And if they do, they probably don't have call waiting. So it's a hearing cultural thing. So when I go from spoken English into ASL, I'm going to coach it, or sort of, some people will call it coaching the deaf person, but really it's cultural mediation. So I might do something like this.
So a little bit of an explanation, cultural mediation. I'm kind of explaining some odd thing that might not be clear to the deaf community or deaf culture. Think of an example that would work in reverse. You're voicing for a deaf presenter by giving an autobiography of their life, explaining where they grew up, where they went to school, blah, 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 and you're voicing for them. What might come up that they talk about that hearing people in general won't know? Same fact. Absolutely. What else? Residential school. Right. And you're never going to say institution, but saying residential school is not enough. Because how many of you even really knew what a residential school was before you got into this program? If you were to say boarding school, huh, now we as hearing people might know. So that might be a really good cultural mediation. So that's what you've done now. And you can say, I went to Illinois School for the Deaf, a boarding school. That's enough for the hearing people to go, okay, now I know what you're talking about. But if you just say, I went to Illinois School, I went to Illinois School for the Deaf, a residential school. Then people will be like, yes, what's a residential school? I don't know what that is, because we're not familiar with it. So, in ASL, we coach, we coach, we expand a little bit on things that might not be familiar to them, and we also expand a little bit. There's no compression when it comes to coaching. You're just kind of expanding and explaining. Now, you can go overboard, and going overboard would be adding to the message, and that would be a very, very bad thing. Okay. So, that presenter again, I grew up, went to Illinois residential school. I'm voicing for them. And we never want to say, as a deaf child, I went to the Illinois residential school. The residential school is just for deaf kids. Located in Jacksonville, Illinois, and parents usually drop their kids off on Monday and they get to pick them up on the weekend and they come home for the weekend. But they stay there in dorms with a concept way too much cultural mediation, way too much coaching. Got it? Make sense? Just enough so that the people have an idea of the different cultures, and then if the audience wants to ask more about what a residential school is, what kind of way can do it? Not up to you to explain it. That's why you're not supposed to be explaining it. Good? Okay. So we have explained by example. Again, this is the one in ASL. There are no huge major category labels. In English, we use category labels. This sign, you all see the sign before the type of family. This says two F. This is an initialized sign that is used now by the deaf community all the time. Everybody uses family to sign in ASL. But when ASL was first created, this there was no sign. This it was explained by example. That's my family group. We've changed it to this, and it's now acceptable. Okay. But let's say in ASL, you uh, see this. How would you interpret that? Etiquette class. class, where I learned how to use organized our example. Cutlery, utensils, cutlery, silverware, flatware. That's the category label. Yes, etiquette class, beautiful. I was trying to get it, silverware. But when you start saying forks and knives and spoons, now you're giving examples. We're compressing it into English using the category label. If I'm interpreting from English into ASL and someone says silverware, I go because there's no sign for silverware. 
you're not going to finger sell it. You're going to explain by example. So the expansion of categories by example, compression of examples into category label. Got it? what I'm seeing, the sign, the sign, the sign, is you're going to want to just get everything out there. And then you'll start listening to yourself and your own interpretations, and you'll start going, oh, that doesn't really sound very natural. Oh, I could have just said, oh, you save yourself. You save your voice. You save your cognitive energy. You save your eyes. They start going four, two, nine, similar. Got it. Make that transition into what is natural for us as English speakers. Uh, describe, then do. Direct address, this is one of the most difficult, difficult um, area to get away from. Let me do shaking your head. One of the first things about rhetorical questions that you learn in ASL is role shifting, right? Love role shifting. It's so clear. Um, and it's so easy to do. So you got two people, they're talking, you can go like this and this and this and this and this. Beautiful. We want to do that in ASL. It's a huge part of ASL, but it's not a huge part of English. Close your eyes for a minute and listen. So yesterday I was having a conversation with my husband. He was a little upset about the fact that my house is really dirty. So I said, Well, hon, you know, I'm working a lot, so I don't have time to do it. And he said, Well, it's your domain, it's your job, so you need to get it done. And I said, Well, how about if you work a little bit extra, and then you can afford to hire a maid. And he said, doesn't that sound kind of crazy? If I was going to tell you that story in English, I would probably say, yesterday my husband and I were having an argument about the house being clean. He insisted it was my job, and I was um, of a, another opinion or something. Right? Just, so in English, we don't use that first person address. We give a holistic view, like a paraphrase of the conversation. In intimate settings, we might. Yeah, like if Elaine and I were best friends, I might want to talk to what you said. You know, I might do that intimately, but in any other formal setting, you're not really going to talk like that. You're going to kind of just describe what happened or the conversation. But in ASL, we do that. So if I read in English, Yesterday, my husband and I had this huge argument about the cleanliness of the house, and it was ridiculous. I might interpret that as ASL like this. I do have an option. Like, if I started with happened, and he would say, no. <laughs> happened yesterday. Getting <laughs> 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 a little crazy. Yeah. Exactly, I think I might have. I'm going to change it into role shifting because that's ASL. That makes it clear. So you may not hear dialogue in English when you're interpreting into ASL. Make it into dialogue. It's fine. You're not changing the meaning. The meaning is also there. It becomes so much clearer in ASL. When you see it in ASL, you can't watch this person shift back and forth and interpret. Yesterday, I was having this conversation with my husband, and he said, it's your job, you need to take care of the house, and then I said, so you're going to be watching it, and you're going to want to just start, as soon as you say, he said, think of how you write in English, he said, comma, quotes, that means you're going right into direct address and dialogue. Avoid that. So you have to hold back and watch, and then summarize the dialogue. That's fair. You won't do it. You'll do first person, and I'm expecting that you do first person um, because that's just where you're going to start. You're going to see it, and you're going to just want to say it exactly what you see, which is perfectly acceptable. But one of the more advanced techniques that you need to learn 
as you progress through your interpretive skills is to back off of it and think about how we say things in English. And we normally don't say them that way. And we need to make it more idiomatic and we need to make it sound a little bit more natural. And your and teachers and instructors and your peers will give you feedback as you go. But you, you'll fall into this track. We all do. Even seasoned interpreters. It's really hard not to. How you tell me, you give me an example. Beautiful. Yeah. My suggestion was if we worked a little bit more, we could afford a housekeeper. We did do very much. Beautiful. The so summarization, you never one point right into dialogue. He said, I said, he said, I said, that's what you want to avoid. But that is what you're going to see, right? And then you're going to see his comment, and then you're going to see my comment, and then you're going to see his comment, and you're going to want to go, he said, I said, he said, I said, just try to avoid it. Good? That's their person. Basically, what we were just talking about. Here's a good example. Mom told her son, I want you to drink your milk. This is what you would see in ASL. Right? And you would want to say, the mom told her son, I want to see you drink your milk. But instead, getting out of first person, you could say, the mother told her son she wanted him to drink his milk. That's third person. No direct address at all. Does that make sense? Like exactly what you just did. Good? All right. What do we think about these strategies? What do you think? Sure. Going from ASL to English to English to ASL and interpreting is not as easy as anybody thinks. Their person is the hardest. Don't worry. It'll take you a while to get there. If you go into dialogue, it's perfectly acceptable right now. Your focus is going to be understanding the deaf signer and getting the message out. But in the back of your mind, just keep thinking as the words are leaving your mouth, try to make them sound like the way English speakers speak. Good? Alright. Alright, let's um one twenty nine. Let's take our fifteen minute break now. And the A's and I's can take the break and then scoot on over into the high tech lab. You guys can come back in here. One, two, three, four, five. There's only five of you today, so there should be a lot of practice in here. So there's only five of you, so it's very helpful. Power.